Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John. This is episode 190. Remember, if you have questions, and I do my best to answer each and every one, <clears throat> you'll send them to us at podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. It can be tough sometimes, uh, but I, we try. Uh, we have some good questions today. Uh, we're coming to the end of our inner circle, and that was wonderful. And there's a new one starting up. Uh, probably as you're listening to this, the, this next one might be up. But remember, uh, DanJohnInnerCircle.com. Also, I have a new book out, uh, the Easy Strength Omni Book, and you can find that at EasyStrengthOmniBook.com. Whole bunch of information there. I think you'll like. And I'm currently working on a supplement to the book. Um, it'll be very inexpensive. It's my work on the Easy Strength uh, for Fat Loss materials, which are very popular. I'm, I'm kind of surprised how many people are doing it right now. And of course, I have to be careful when I talk about fat loss. That's that's not necessarily my strength. Uh, it's it, But a lot of people ask me about it. And, once I started experimenting with some of these ideas, uh, once I started doing it, once I had kind of a life change to uh, encourage myself to, to drop some uh, so drop some weight originally, so I get into a lighter weight class, and then I started feeling so good, I, I started taking the fat loss stuff much more seriously. Uh, it'll be out soon. It'll be very inexpensive. Um, I, uh, it'll be a lot of material right now. <laughs> Last night I was up to 200 pages, which as of course, you know, I have to whittle that down because really let's review, uh, make your to-do list, get a good night's sleep, wake up, drink some coffee, uh, fast until you work out. After you work out, go for a walk and then, you know, <laughs> eat veggies and protein and drink water as much as you need the rest of the day. And that's the whole program. And I probably just lost a lot of money doing that. No, I didn't. Well, it's good to have you back. And the first question is, is, is weirdly, it's a very small question, but uh, it, got, it got me thinking. So the question is this, and it comes from Carl. My question today is regarding saunas. Saunas. What are your thoughts on traditional steam versus infrared? <clears throat> well, first off, there, there's another option that I think you're missing, and that's what I have right there. In fact, as soon as I finish this podcast today, I'll be jumping in it. Uh, I have a, a home sauna, sauna, I keep getting told when I go to the store. Um, the downside of steam is that they're always broken. I mean, okay, let's just, I'm just going to bounce through some things real fast before I talk about the, the, the value of the, the hot sauna. The downside of a steam bath is that you're mixing, <laughs> you're mixing water with electricity. Now, uh, my friends and I, we're all we're all in our mid sixties now. We've been joking about we uh, uh, we should write a book called Stuff We Know. Uh, it's about how to do like basic home repairs and stuff. Overwhelmingly, everybody agrees on one thing: when you mix water and electricity, you have to bring in the professionals. Um, <laughs> I've had three hot tubs in my life. Uh, hot tubs have a shelf life, and when they break, uh, you get them repaired a few times, and it's like, no, they're done. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess around with electricity and water. I don't like steam rooms only because they always break, and it's not an if, it's but it's a when. Moreover, I don't know, I don't know if anybody sells a home use steam room. Uh, maybe they do. I mean, obviously, you know, it's like when your daughter takes a shower, she steams up the bathroom for days, especially if you live in this climate. Uh, I don't know if there's a home. If there is, I'm sorry. Now, infrared, I don't know much about because I don't have one. What I have is a good old fashioned sauna. And I'm a huge fan of saunas. Now, I know a few years ago, the rage was to, you know, soak yourself in ice baths and stuff like that. And, it, and there's great value in it. And I watched a TV show where a, a person went through all kinds of traumas, you know, that were relieved by uh, the ice bath. I know this, and this comes from some of the professionals I work with the military, that for those of us with concussion issues, and hi, I'm Dan, I have concussion issues. Um, 
you know, the, the cold, uh, the cryotherapy, the cold is supposed to be quite good. Now, of course, living in Utah in the last year with our, with our record breaking snow, I don't need to spend any more money to get cold. All I need to do is go outside in another snowstorm and shovel some more. The interesting thing, and I think it's in Brad Pellin's book on heat, is that he compares what happens to your, you physiologically <clears throat> pardon me, uh, when you do an ice bath and when you take a sauna. And the interesting thing is, and it's something called heat reactive proteins, and I'm already out of my lane by just saying that sentence, but the, the reactions are the ex exact same. Now, here's the, here's the issue for me. I can make myself ice bath. I think I can. Except, you know what? I notice I don't. So with all my discipline, and, and I don't, don't want to pat myself too much in the back, but, you know, I can show you through my career and my life that, you know, I, I, I have a lot of self-discipline. I'm, I'm very good at it. I took courses on it to improve it. Uh, I can train by myself. I can work by myself. You know, I've got those little, those, those skills. But man, to jump into an ice bath five days a week and just sit there, you know, is, is for me very difficult. Having said that, I sauna five days a week. And uh, I'm starting to sauna now before uh, my mobility and flexibility work. So if we're going to do mobility work, say at 930, I'll jump on the sauna at probably eight and get a half hour sauna in. Um, I listen to, uh, I use brain.fm. I, I put on the unguided meditation and I calm down. And, and the reason I need the hour is I want to shower up. Sometimes I have to set things up, but I've gone as late as nine ten in the sauna and still was ready by nine thirty. So I got to rethink, uh, starting so early, uh, many afternoons I'll sauna in the, the later afternoon, uh, so with, with the meditation, the unguided meditation uh, music, just to kind of cool down, especially if, uh, like right now, I'm writing a new book, so I get in these flurries of typing, and then I hit a wall, and I find that if I set the timer on the sauna, and I, and I say, well, now I've got 25 minutes to finish up all this stuff in a day, and it used to be called end, end, spurt productivity. And uh, they found that with a lot of businesses, a whole bunch of sales happened at uh, 11.50, 10 minutes to noon. A lot of work got done at 4.30 to 5 o'clock when the, when the company closed the doors. And uh, I program that into my brain. I know that if I set a timer, that I'll get that work done. Now, the nice thing about having the, when I set my uh, sauna, uh, it's got this little noise, uh, and it it's not exactly a timer tick, 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 ticking down, but the noise reminds me I've got to get things done. I, very rarely do I write anything at that time, but I'll edit, I'll double check things, I'll shuffle around chapters and paragraphs and things like that. So I do the work of being a writer without doing the work of writing, so to speak. Yeah, I'm a big fan of saunas. I like what they do for my, I've got a few joints that have uh, some arthritis issues. Uh, my right ankle, you know, when you throw the discus 15,000 times a year for 41 years, the right ankle, you just you, you do that, you know, under a lot of stress. I, I have some small issues there with arthritis. Now I've got the general issues, uh, you know, the other day we had three back-to-back -back snowstorms that were kind of unexpected. You know, shoveling snow is hard on my old throwing muscles. And so the sauna seems to help me relax. And I do a little bit of easy mobility work. And I do a little bit of easy uh, flexibility work. Now, I also work on some other uh, things. Uh, very often when I sauna, I take a hair conditioner. And I would strongly suggest, you be very careful when you do this, to put it here and bring it back. Don't let that stuff get in your eyes. It's not as bad as soap, but it, it can be irritating. I also do some other things. I have some brushes and um, in the past, I used to have some scrapers and stuff where, you know, you take them and you, 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 you scrub your skin and you scrape your skin. 
Um, they often leave kind of weird red welts on some people, uh, depending on the part of the body. Uh, I do it, I get some. Uh, I also use, I want to bring this in. This is a little device I found on Amazon, and this is a little machine. You press the button, and it's a pore sucker, P-O-R-E sucker. And I'm like, yeah, that's disgusting. It's disgusting, but I got to tell you one thing. It cleans out the pores really well. Uh, I would caution you about uh, putting on uh, any kinds of creams and lotions in a, in a sauna. Uh, if you do, uh, bring it in with you put it on and then put it back outside because those oils heat up a lot and you can really scald yourself. Um, and then it's really hard to get, <laughs> that burning oil is hard to kind of get off your skin. So, you know, I've also read, and to prepare for this question, I read online that uh, there's a rule called Allen's Rule. Now, I remember this from my youth because my brother Phil, uh, his middle name was uh, Allen, Philip Allen John. Not, and I just remembered it because of that. But the Allen, the, the Allen law is that if you see a, a rabbit with very short ears and kind of puffy, they tend to be from the colder regions. And as rabbits get into hotter and hotter areas, their, their ears get longer and longer, their legs get longer, and they get more and more uh, ripped and lean, which comes to that thing called jackrabbit starvation. Um, why do I even bring that this up? Is that heat tends to make mammals lean out. Now, some people believe that there's also big growth hormone releases from doing saunas. Uh, again, now we're running into places you got to be a little careful of because, you know, if you think the reason you didn't make the Olympic team was because you didn't release enough growth hormone taking your sauna, I could probably have another discussion. I love. I like my sauna. I like for what it does in my head. I like what it does in my joints, my my injuries. I think it helps me in my overall health. Uh, I'm hoping it helps with my longevity. Uh, and it's also, you know, if if you ever just really need to talk somebody, to somebody and just kind of clear the air, so to speak, s stinky, hot, sweaty air, uh, a sauna is a good place to have a conversation. I'm also doing something now, now this is, by the time this comes out, I might have stopped doing this already, but I also now listen to podcasts in the sauna, and I got to tell you, you're a much more captive audience in a sauna than you are in your car. The one thing I hate, most podcasts have commercials about every 15 seconds. <clears throat> most of these fitness, fitness people online have commercials every 15 seconds, and they're sponsored by everybody. Not me. I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com. And if you, I think I'll stop that. That was an attempt at humor. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, Carl, uh, that was a good question. And I like those kind of questions that get me, uh, kind of perk my ears up if we want to go back to the rabbit observation. All right, move on. We got a question from Mari. And Mari says, <laughs> do you give any weight, no pun intended, to the idea that a trainee should counterbalance all of their push work with a two-to-one ratio of pull work. Well, well, well. Um, when you're looking for people who recommend it, one of the names you'll find, his name is uh, Dan John, and he's a wonderful young man, Mary. Uh, Mari. Here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> now, there's a cliche. I've been saying too much later. i got to break that cliche out of my vocabulary. I really strongly recommend that with North American males because most North American males I work with have used the bench press as the answer to all questions, push-ups as the conditioning for all, you know, punishment and, you know, the old high school coach, give me 20 push-ups, you know, the, you know, the movies about the military, give me a hundred push-ups and all that nonsense. Um, so what happens over time is you get this. And for those of you listening, I'm bringing my shoulders forward. I'm tightening up my pecs. I'm tightening up the, my, the front part of my deltoids. And I'm putting my rhomboids to sleep and everything else. So most of the men I work with from, especially the United States, uh, and of course we have throwing games, uh, they need a lot of extra work 
uh, on their polls. Now, a couple of things I recommend. Uh, if you are in a deficit like I was, I always like you to pause for a couple of seconds. I would say two seconds is about the right amount of time because if you can hold for one, two, you get almost all the benefits. I like the thumbs to come into the armpits, get those elbows back. This becomes that bat wing position I talk about in a lot of my work. And then hold it there. Now, the interesting thing is I've worked with men who can't put their thumbs in their armpits because they're so jacked up in the shoulders. You know, if you can't put your thumbs in your armpits and just do it with no weight, you got some other issues. Um, and so one of the ways we've kind of, it's not perfect, but one of the ways we've been dealing with this is by doing the two to one pull to push ratio. Uh, I do it, I sneak into this answer. We have what's called, uh, Mike Warren Brown leads this. We call it the TRX hypertrophy warmup and don't even know what that means. I, I don't even remember why it's called that. But we do an excessive amount of T's, Y's, I's, single arm rows, double arm rows in our warmup. Lots and lots. So we do a lot of, those would be, that family's almost all horizontal rowing. Uh, and the reason we do that is everyone in there you know, is North American almost most of the time. Most are male. We, we have many females who train with us, many women who train with us. But we're, we're in our warm-up, we are getting all that work in before we do anything else. My formula for most of the men I work with who have my issue, which is the same one I do this, is excessive suspension trainer T, Y, I, single arm row, rows, and then vertical, either one arm presses or uh, double presses, vertical. That seems to help a lot of guys with their shoulder issues. Uh, we are start starting to get more women with the problem. And uh, I mean, obviously it's not the cascade of, I, I, I was told one time that 90% of American male cadavers uh, have, uh, visible shoulder issues. Well, that's a pretty high rate. You know, it became my joke. You know, how do I know you have shoulder issues? You're a North American male. Um, so I wouldn't say we're at 90% on women yet, but it is, it is starting to come up with, you know, again, probably throwing sports and then probably the emphasis on a horizontal pushing you see in most American gyms. There's nothing wrong with doing a lot of bench press. There's nothing wrong with doing a lot of push-ups. You just got to remember that you've got to balance it out. And you can either balance it out when you're training as a 13-year-old or when you come to me in your 50s, then we have to go to that more aggressive two-to-one ratio. Thank you. Uh, that was a good question. Uh, it really was. <laughs> we got a question from Ben. I've read a few people recommend increasing the speed of your reps when doing compound lifts to build power as an alternative to just increasing the load. I don't Olympic lift, but train regularly with deadlifts, overhead squats, and pretty much all the other kettlebell and bodyweight exercises. What is the difference in strength gain through slow grinding lifts and fast ballistics lifts? Well, I, I think you have to be a little careful there, uh, Ben. Uh, you know, you can get, you can become weird strong. Uh, we used to say there's five ways to get strong, okay? Power lift, Olympic lift. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, power body build, which is what I see a lot of people do now. Uh, that's when you do the traditional, it's how Reg Park trained. It's how Arnold and Franco trained, uh, where you use uh, the power lifts and just a few accessories. I mean, if uh, I've got Arnold's original, when he was young programs and Franco's programs, and I mean, they were bench, squat, deadlift, curl, military, row, sit up, pull up. I mean, that would be power bodybuilding, big reps, five sets of five. Uh the fourth option is what we call strongman training. Uh, and of course, uh, 
the fifth option is is an intelligent combination of all of them is and that's of course i mean i mean i like to think i'm intelligent but that's kind of what i try to do so i i I'm a little concerned about an either or on this because I think the blend, you know, it's going to be the best way to do everything. You know, for example, would you say uh, farmer walks are, uh, you know, a fast exercise or a slow exercise? Well, when I compete in the farmer walks back in the day in the Highland Games, uh, it is fast twitch. <laughs> you know, I was trying to run those loops as fast as I can because like the one we did at the Pleasanton, you know, at the Pleasanton Highland Games, it was 165 pounds per hand, and it, I mean, it, and it was like they used wire for the handle, and I just remember just being in so much pain because the handle was ripping the skin, this big fold of skin. It was just driving it into my fingers. I didn't have any permanent damage except for my uh, embarrassment. Uh, so... Uh, and then, you know, the, I've had people talk about these things called fast deadlifts. And of course, in the Olympic lifts, we have the, we used to call them halting snatches and halting cleans, which are, are you know, uh, uh, lifts where you pause at a certain position and then nail it. So we're always going to do a little combination on both sides here. But to get to your actual question, um, I, th I think there's always value in doing explosive work and spring or jumping or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the first article I ever read from Clarence Bass was a conversation he had with Terry Todd. And they were both lamenting the fact that their spring had gone in their life. That's the, to, they were just talking about the importance of jumping up on a curb. And I, and, I, and I enjoyed that. I probably read that when I think I must have read it when I was 41. It was when I first went on the Internet. I first started my site, so maybe it was when I was 40. And I thought to myself, well, this is a good thing to remember. Well, you know, 25 years later, I'm like, yeah, that's really important stuff. So how do you keep spring? Let's let's do it this way. How do you keep spring in your, in your life without, uh, without uh, doing the Olympic lifts? The kettlebell swing, the kettlebell snatch, the kettlebell clean. There you go. Um, because of my titanium hips, uh, I do sprints backwards. Uh, now, it looks weird, my, <laughs> and people were making fun of it uh, for a while until they started doing it. But, uh, you know, when I played defensive back, you know, we backpedaled. And I, because of the forces, the biomechanics and the physics of having titanium hips, when I run, run, or worse, the worst thing I can do is jog, that vertical stuff. Um, there's that pounding on the legs as they strike the ground. Oddly, when I backpedal, I don't have to worry about it. So I mix my backpedaling with marching uh, high knee lifts. Boom, 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 boom. Go to any elite, watch any elite track and field athlete and you'll get all this. And I also do that one called butt kickers. And that's where you kind of, you, you march in place and you, you bring your heels up and, you know, kick yourself in your own butt, you know butt kicker uh so even with my little issues you know sprinting backpedaling uh i still can run hills uh i also go up and down hills with mini bands around my ankles um you can get you can get your ballistic work in without being in the weight room i would almost say for many of our listeners it might be a better idea to stay now Here's the problem whenever I talk online, and I and I apologize if I get grumpy. People will take one line, one line at what I say, and then in the comments lose their minds. Uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, I Olympic lift three days a week. You know, I snatch and I front squat and I clean and press, um, you know. But one or two days a week, uh, I get out there and I do my back pedals, my high knees, my butt kickers. For those of you who don't Olympic lift, sprinting up hills, uh, playing games is wonderful. Uh, Backpedaling, butt kickers, high knees, that kind of thing might be just as good, if not better, for many of our listeners. So, yeah, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of uh, hedging my answer here a little bit. I'd love to see it do the ballistic work with kettlebells. If you can't, think about taking it out on the field to play.
Okay, thank you. Uh, Alan. Oh, sorry. Uh, we got a, uh, okay, real quick. Uh, we have a question from Alan. I will answer it. Uh, I, I have a note here uh, that I, I don't, I really don't need to. He says, how does one prepare for the RKC Kettlebell Instructor Kettlebell Instructor cert Certification Workshop? Listen, man, uh, I got one over at uh, Dragon Door. I got one over at Strong First. And if you go to Dan John University, we actually have the workout generator designed to walk you through. Uh, Mike Warren Brown and I went through and put together, uh, I want to say 12-week program at Minor No, I think it's 12. Uh, but it's very simple. Uh, I think the best thing you can still do is the rite of passage workout from, from Pavel. I still think that's the best way to do it. I did mine with a 28K. That's all I had at the time was a single 28K. And then uh, the other thing we recommend is that we do have one day a week where you practice the snatch for high reps. And in the program, Alan, um, you know, we just have you do hundreds <laughs> with the snatch. Uh, this is some. This is where I disagree with a lot of the other kettlebell uh, people. Uh, the test is a hundred snatches, so I believe you should test yourself. You should practice one hundred. I don't want to hear that you can do, you know, a one hundred kilo snatch, you know, for five. That doesn't help you. How much, you know, it's it's one hundred snatches under five minutes. So at our gym, we emphasize. So if I'm expected to use a 24 early in the testing, weeks one, weeks two, we might do a test with the 12K. And at the end of that first test, we, we're going to do 100 reps in the snatch with the 12K. Don't worry about hand switches, just go. And at the end of that first test, you know, I ask a very simple question. Is it your lungs? Is it your guns? Or is it your buns? Now, for a lot of people, they can't lock out a load 100 times, that would be guns. Many people don't have the, the the butt ability to hinge, 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 hinge powerfully 100. There's your buns, people. Sorry. And then in my case, um, I mean, I had bad, um, I had some issues with pneumonia as a child, as a baby. And then I, I struggle with this disease called pleurisy. And it's like my doctor says, he, I'm the only non-smoker he's ever had to deal with multiple bouts of pleurisy. And I said, why? He goes, because you're lucky. And I thought, well, that's just the, the, uh, lucky me. But for me, it's the lungs. I sound like a broken freight train when I do it. I've got the guns and I got the buns. But <gasps> so for me, I spend more time with 10s and 12s doing like three sets of 101 workout versus say doing, you know, heavy 28s and 32s. Cause I don't need that. I need to get that going. Okay. <laughs> uh, for those of you who listen to the car, enjoy that. So yeah, so it's, uh, it's uh, danjohnuniversity.com. The whole program's in there with all the explanations. And I think it's also in the workout generator. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay. Thank you. I know it's a short answer, but I feel like I've really covered it in depth many times. We have a question from Dante. Now, Dante's answered uh, uh, several of these before. Uh, uh, pardon me. Uh, he's uh, asked several questions before, and I'm always happy to answer. You talk about Coach Mon lift three. Okay. First time I met Coach Mon, for those you who don't know, I said, Coach, what's the secret to throwing the discus for? And, you know, I got my, you know, I got my pen and paper, you know. And he goes, oh, yeah, okay. Lift weights three days a week. Got it. Okay, got it. Throw the discus four days a week. Okay, got it. For the next eight years. <gasps> oh. Because then that, by the way, is the secret to everything, you know. How do you have a great retirement, save money, you know, next eight years? Yeah. So let's continue. How many sets and reps with what loads were a typical week back then? How many full throws and drills with a single practice? How much massage and hot tub and food went into that hard training as an elite athlete? Okay, first off, there was no massage when I was in college. Uh, I did, we did at Utah State have a steam room and a sauna, but we also had the pool and a couple, about one or two nights a week, my buddies from Bullen Hall, my, my 621 Bullen Hall, we would uh, go to the 
go to the Hyper, H-P-E-R, Health, P-E, Recreation Center, and go swimming. I think it was Tuesday nights. And after we uh, kind of, I mean, we didn't swim. We hung around and splashed at each other. And then we would steam and go home. And uh, I mean, it, you know, we didn't really do anything. You know, anyway, that, that was our, that was a, that was just a typical night. Thursday nights, we went to the movies for a dollar. And uh, so I, in hindsight, I think though, those Tuesday nights, it's interesting because Tuesdays and Thursday nights, even now are still my light are my light days. Kind of funny how these things develop and they just stick in your mind. And I, and I appreciate your question because it's reminding me. For food, I just shoveled as much food down my throat as I possibly could. I remember sitting in the cafeteria and this young lady says to me, I would do anything if I could eat all I wanted. And I can remember thinking, well, there was an F-bomb in there, but I was like, no, you don't. You have no idea how hard it is to shovel down this much food. Um, my body weight my senior year wouldn't stay up, but I've mentioned this before. I've talked about it in a couple of my books, but uh, you know, I showed up at 105 kilos, 231. Very quickly, I was down to 99, 218. And uh, it was because I was Olympic lifting three days a week, uh, throwing the discus shot, hammer, uh, would have been six days a week. And then we had all these other things like hill sprints and stuff to do. And then uh, Coach Bradley famous recommended I start drinking beer every night. And I was like, oh, okay. That worked out nice. So beer was my, what did I call it? My uh, analgesic uh, electrolyte beverage or something like that. Uh, so uh, in the weight room, especially my senior year, uh, I'm going to tell you the whole program, but you're going to go, well, what else is there? Uh, Mondays was my volume day. Uh, that had been fives. I would have done, I did squat snatches, power cleans, back squats, occasionally bench press. And my heavy day was Wednesday, those same lifts. Uh, I would go heavy. And on Friday, we would do, and this is Coach Bradley's idea, 80% for a single, which is funny because I can remember, you know, boy, I mean, I would just throw some weight on there and it'd be like, like sometimes I didn't even feel like I had to warm up. I want to say that before my best meets, the meets were on Saturday. I think one time I went in there and I think I, my workout was a squat snatch, 225, 102 kilos. I power clean, 315, uh, 142.5. And I back squatted 365, you know, 165 kilos. And I think the total workout might have been including the warm-ups, I would say like six or seven reps because I just didn't need it. I just, but the nice thing is that 80% for a single really wired me and fired me up. And I just, I was, I left always hungry for more, which of course is what you wanted because the next day we had to track me. So that's the basic program. <clears throat> and so my senior year, it was snatch, uh, squat snatch, power clean, uh, I stopped doing front squats my senior year because they I had to throw the shot because we needed the points. Uh, and I found that uh, doing the front squat and throwing the shot was just hard on my wrist for me. I mean, you, the big, you know, the guys with the big wrists, probably not the biggest deal. So I just back squatted and I don't think I went over 385 as a senior. I just didn't think I needed it. Uh, and I did do some bench, but not very much because I just, I don't know. Didn't need it anymore. Um, uh, nothing, nothing fancy. But now we're looking at, you know, I mean, not to pat myself in the back too hard, but you know, I was a Division One MVP. I mean, that was good. You know, uh, you know, I, I was a conference champion for four years in a row. You know, at these these other schools, and yeah, I, I was strong. I was a good background as an Olympic lifter. I didn't need as much in the weight room that year. Throwing, uh, I threw the discus uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then of course meets on Saturday. The shot put, I threw Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. And the hammer, I think I went Monday, Thursday. No, probably Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So I tried to make it so that all I did on Wednesdays on my heavy day was throw the discus and weightlift. 
Uh, Monday was a long day, so I threw all three events that day, plus all the volume in the weight room. Can you see how this is kind of working out? Uh, Friday uh, was mostly like hammer and discus, you know, the lighter events for me. And then, of course, I did whatever I had to do on Saturday. My senior year at Utah State, we had a lot of meets on Friday. Uh, famously, I had a meet on Friday, but Pocatello out of Idaho State on Friday, <laughs> came home, <laughs> went to bed, got up, hopped on a bus to Provo the next day, had a full track meet on Saturday, came home Saturday night and, you know, kind of wondered what was I doing with my life? Because I, I just was sunburned and frozen from all those weight, uh, from all those track meets. So, you know, when you're in your teens and 20s, you don't have to, you know, worry about recovery. Now, your second question. Dante asks this. I'm too old. I'm too old and busy to pretend I can train and play and recover like my 19-year-old self. I finally accept that, but I was never, ever elite. So I'm curious what the details of a training week looked like for, for you when you were and moving away from that now that it inspired easy strength. And I like that question. I like how you finished it up uh, because could I have trained easy strength when I was at uh, Utah State? Yeah, probably. In fact, it would have been great, but I couldn't have done it. You know, five days a week. And in fact, I had a good conversation with Dr. Tom Fahey about this one time. Press, hinge, five days a week, two sets of five, when the bench slowed down, go to inclines. When the incline slowed down, go to decline. When the decline slowed down, go to military. When the military slowed down, go to bench. Five days a week, five days a week, five days a week. Uh, I don't think I could handle it mentally because I, I like to. I wanted to test myself. Um, easy strength uh, plus sports training is probably the smartest thing I've done in my life. But you got to also realize that my, remember, my best year uh, as a discus thrower was, what, two, 2004, 5, 6, or 7, one of those. And I was in my late 40s. 47 was my best year, so whatever that would have been. So I guess 2004 or 5, whatever. Uh, the reason I improved so much in my later years is when I was in my 40s, I trained. Yeah, and I look back on this now, and I, and I think I can be honest and candid with you. I trained appropriate for a 40-year-old with two full-time jobs and two middle school daughters. My training was spot on. My throwing sessions were 45 minutes. My weight workouts were 15. Um, I threw all. I threw almost entirely into walls, so that not every, I never had to walk out of, uh, for a discus. When I did go outside to throw, I would throw four discs, and then I would sprint out to get them. I would do a drill to get the discs back, and then I'd sprint back to the ring. And so, in a you know, in a workout, I would get you know anywhere from ten to I don't know, forty, be an exaggeration. Yeah, yeah, forty. Okay, ten to twenty to thirty sprints in a workout, and then you know I was I was much smarter about what I put in my stomach. Uh, in in in, in my forties, you know, I was much. I did that those couple of years at Adkins. I did paleo. And so my diet was much cleaner than it was in college or any other time in my life before that. And I think that all tied in. Recovery uh, for my 40th birthday, I got a hot tub. So I was hot tubbing practically every day uh, in my 40s. But I, I like your question and I hope I am answering it okay. So if your life supports eight hour workouts every day, do it but you better plan in some smart recovery. If your life allows one hour workout every day and you have to be kind of vigilant about your recovery, you have to be a little smarter. Easy strength for fat loss is an hour workout every day, every day, 15 minute weight workout, 45 minute walk. When you finish the walk, you eat, you know, for me, I, I just start pulling, I got this system where I pull, everything's in glass jars and I just pull the vegetables out and the salmon, and if I cook eggs, I cook eggs, but salmon, kimchi, sauerkraut, I've got my overnight oats with the seeds and the protein, I've got the, the garlic, uh, the, 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 pardon me, not the garlic, uh, the sliced ginger, the sushi ginger, um, 
I, oh, I've got the leftover vegetables from the night before on the plate, on the plate, on the plate, shovel it in, shovel it in, move on to my day. So you ha I think you have to plan your recovery, your diet, uh, your training all around what's real and doable for you in this real time as things are going. I, I In my mind, it makes perfect sense. And I hope it makes sense to you. Uh, I appreciate the chance to talk about Coach Mon at Utah State all the time. I've got a big little thing over there about Utah State on my wall. And the whole time I've been getting my eyes getting pulled over to that Utah State stuff. So thank you very much. It's, it was a nice memory. And I think there's a, there's, a, there's a truism about what I said. You have to always train, eat, and recover appropriate to what's going on in your life. Thank you. So we had a simple question here. Uh, Ray asks, my brother's name is Ray. My dad is 75 and pretty active. Golf four to five days a week, all walking. Good for him. Get off those golf carts. I'm looking to get him into kettlebells, but I worry about hurting him with either too much too soon, as far as volume goes, or too much too soon with the way of the bells. Any advice on the way to start? Yeah, I got a book. I don't know how easy it is to find called The Hard Style Kettlebell Challenge. And I talk about the Turkish getup, the goblet squat, and the swing. And honestly, variations of the Turkish getup, not necessarily the Turkish getup itself, like you see online with people using these ridiculous amounts of weights and the one guy dropped it on his chest and he, then he called me an idiot for questioning why he did it. <laughs> i tell you one thing, man. If you're in the casket and you're, I walk up and you know everyone's crying, and I say, "What happened?" Uh, he dropped a he dropped a, a weight on himself doing a doing a Turkish getup. I, I will pray with your family and I'll be very kind. But in the back of the mind, uh, my mind, I'll be thinking, "I'm the idiot." Okay, the end. Um, very so anything that gets him up and down off the floor, anything that can be done, uh, like in the book, you'll find the, the rolling forty fives and the rolling tees. Uh, like he's a golfers are like discus throwers. So anytime he does rolling work, anytime he does any efforts where he's got, I mean, you can even just do something as easy as holding a bell on the chest like this and rolling and you know rolling yourself to the sides and slowly grinding yourself up. Uh, valuable. Goblet squats, if you can do those, they're marvelous uh, for many people's lower back and hips. Your mileage may vary. Uh, and not the swing necessarily, but anything in the in the hinge family. I mean, I uh, if you go on my site here, look up the magic drill or the Bulgarian goat bag, the Bulgarian goat bag swing, the some of the other swing variations I teach at the RKC events. I think you'll get a lot of value out of that, okay? Um, now, because your dad is is, is a male, he probably would want to do some presses also. Uh, um, most men like to press, but the only thing is I would kind of insist on just vertical. Um, the nice thing about vertical uh, is if there are shoulder issues, it'll show up here versus like when some people have bench press issues, it shows up here, the weight bounces out, and now you have real shoulder issues. Um, I like, uh, I have a workout, and you can look it right up, called the perfect workout, and that's what I would recommend for your dad. So it's half kneeling presses, hangs, uh, the glute loop hip thrust and the glute loop clamshell, the gobble squat into the overhead squat, and the suitcase carry. Listen, uh, uh, and I, uh, I should write a book on that, just that one eight minute workout because I'm starting to do it almost every day now as my warm up. It's, it's been really cold as my warm up for my warm up. And I got to tell you, folks, uh, I can feel, I can just feel things realigning. I keep joking that it's the poor man's chiropractor, but it does. It makes me feel good. It makes me move good. And, you know, and gosh darn, it makes me look good. So try that. Try the look up the perfect workout. Look at it, you know. Obviously, change things as appropriate. And the other, and, and one final thing: high five your dad. Being seventy five and getting out there five days a week is impressive. So, I'm giving him a health. Since I can't be there in real life, I'm gonna give myself a self high five.
And that's for your dad. Thank you. Our last question today is uh, an interesting question, only because I don't think uh, Jim realizes the, the whole question here. It, Jim says this, I am wondering if, what if any cardio you would include on the off days of the hypertrophy and recovery program, also known as the post-deployment. Uh, it's on danjohnuniversity.com. It's in the book Attempts, I'm pretty sure. I think it's also in the Easy Strength Omni book. EasyStrengthOmnibook.com. I'm pretty sure it's in the. Sometimes, see, one of the things, folks, you might not realize, I don't read my own books after they're published because you get kind of sick of them. Uh, actually, I've heard actors say the same things about their roles. They just can't watch them. And it's not that I hate my work. It's just, you know, you just. Um, it's just, I don't know. I, I, I see the flaws and the mistakes and I get really negative on myself. But, uh, I'm looking mostly for a modest increase in ability to cover distance uh, up to a 10K. So your question is this, is it okay to do cardio on off days? Now in the post-deployment thing, we came up with that. Uh, I was working with a special forces guy, a, a friend of mine, and he had had 14 deployments. And I gotta tell you, um, my friend was, was getting pretty broken. And what he needed, he needed, he needed to work on like just, I mean, hypertrophy and mobility. He needed, and some work capacity. It, Jim, if you do the program and, and don't just read it, but do the damn thing, you know, on week four, week eight and week 12, you're doing four rounds of, I could top of my head, six or seven loaded carries in the workout. I mean, how much more work capacity work do you need? Now, if you want to do cardio, I would recommend probably something that's a little bit more of a power law kind of cardio. Uh, the Swedes used to call it Fartlek, um, Percy Sarity, um, his, his programs, but something along the idea where go find a park with a hill. Uh, you walk around the park, when you come to the hill, sprint up the hill. Uh, at the top of the hill, when you hit the crest, uh, slow down into a, a, a gentle jog, um, maybe continue the walk on a flat section, maybe run backwards on a, another flat section, do some skipping or bounding, um, keep walking, find the hill, go back up, and just do this natural kind of workout like that. Uh, I don't, I, I think a lot of people, when they start doing those grind. And, and there's nothing wrong with jogging, there's nothing wrong with running. But what happens to a lot of people who are in the weight room doing these harder, and it's not hard, hard for a program, but it's hard because there's a lot of elements to it. So when on those off days you have, um, don't beat yourself to death. I, I don't, so on those three uh, post-deployment workouts every week, that's what I want. That There's your meat, potatoes, your vegetables, your bread, uh, your sausage, your turkey, and your fish. The other four days a week, it's your, you know, your, it's your spices and, and herbs. It's just a little sprinkling. Uh, I would suggest it's better to finish the program, go through it once, and then see where you really, where you would need to add it in. In a, just a general view, I would say this on week one. So it'd be week one, week five, and uh, week nine. Those would be the weeks you would probably could do the most extra cardio. Uh, the week four, eight, and 12 would be the weeks that just walking probably would be the best deal. I know it's a specific question to, to what you're asking, Jim, but um, I think a lot of people need to keep reminding themselves uh, you can only chase, you know, chase one rabbit at a time until you go hungry. We all know that. It's cliche now, and I say it all the time. But sometimes you have to you have to keep kind of a vision of how you combine uh, extra cardiovascular work to a hard training program. Usually what happens is, is that you here's a hard strength program, here's a hard, you know, running program, cardiovascular program. What happens is people try to do both, and this is what happened. Both drop, 
and you're back to medium, which is the, you know, <laughs> Revelation 3.15, you are lukewarm and I shall spit you out, you know, um, you know, you know, warm, warm tea. It's just life, life is better than, you know, medium heat coffee. So, yeah. So try to stay a little bit hotter on the program and just sprinkle in some extra stuff. Good questions. Hey, I'll tell you one thing. These were good questions this whole time. Uh, I'm, I, I thought that was a, I thought that was a lot of good work and I appreciate it. Gentle listeners for you to come up with this. Uh, remember if you have questions podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'm here to answer each and every one. Uh, I've written a lot of books. I've written a lot of articles in my life, but one of the things I do appreciate when people ask good questions, it gives me even more clarity uh, about the issues that uh, people have. I'm always reminded of, we were playing a game, this is a long time ago in football, and a kid got a five-yard penalty, uh, a wide receiver. I pulled him off the field, and I said, that's you. You were on the line of scrimmage. And he went, oh, that's what you mean. Okay. I thought I knew what I was telling him was, I thought I, I, I know I told him this, but I didn't tell him well enough for him to understand it until he got a five yard penalty. And sometimes in life we need our little flags and five yard penalties to remind yourselves that there, there's lack of clarity. And I hope that made sense. And you know what? Uh, this was a good episode. Uh, I'll be back next week. And until then, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.